Oh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to November's George Talk. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce you to Quincy de Vries, who won one of our uh, journalism awards in 2022. Um, her profession now is uh, preparing podcasts for some very demanding uh, clients, including uh, IT tech companies, banks, and uh, accountancy, large accountancy practices, uh, as, <clears throat> among others. Um, she has uh, a, an initiative that she wants to share with you that she's working on, uh, which fits exactly with our strategic objective of trying to encourage uh, not just more members, but more members who are nearer in age to her than they are to me. <laughs> Over to you, Quincy. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for to everyone who helped organize this and is allowing me to speak to you today. And um, thanks for all of you for taking some time out of your day as well. I know that if you're in the UK, it's around dinner time. So I appreciate that. If you're um, in North America, like I am, I'm based in Toronto, that um, it's it's the middle of your Sunday, so I really appreciate you taking the time to to come and listen to to me and my talk. And I'm hoping that it can be educational and also that we can have um, some good discussion around it afterwards. Um, with that in mind, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully, it's it's going to go well. Um, let's make sure that this is the one I want. That's it, right? Share. Yeah. Is that working? Can you guys? Is ever? Yeah, that's fine. Yep. Perfect. All right. Um, I will say I have two monitors, so I'm watching you here on my um, on my laptop. I have my desktop with the presentation here. So if I'm I'm looking, I swear I'm I'm paying attention. I apologize about that. Um, it's just the way that my my setup is, and I want to be able to look at you all and then also uh, look at the presentation. So I th I'll just start by briefly introducing myself. I know Quinton did, um, but I'm Quincy, as he mentioned. I won one of the um, journalism prizes in 2022. I wrote a piece called "The Cult of Personality of Elon Musk." Um, if you if you happen to read it, and through that I became involved with the society. And um, since then, I I've graduated. I was at the University of Cambridge at the time. I was getting my MPhil in medieval history, um, which is obviously quite different from podcasting. But through my time at Cambridge, I became increasingly involved with journalism especially on the radio. And that led me to becoming a full-time podcast producer, which I am now. Um, I work at an agency based in Toronto and I make um, podcasts for large brands. Um, as Quinton mentioned, a lot of banks, a lot of pharma companies. Um, sometimes I tell people they're the boring podcast. So if you're familiar with podcasts and you're wondering if I've made any that you're familiar with, unfortunately, probably not, but um, hopefully you will be soon once this, once this project is complete. So I've titled this presentation Behind Big Brother. That's my thinking of what I want to title the podcast at the moment. Um, I'll kind of go into the reasons why I want to give it that title as we go on to the target audience and whatnot. Um, this is not fixed in stone. So if you see this and you have an immediate reaction, you don't like it or you have a better idea, I'm really open to feedback for the, the entirety of this project. It's still very much a work in progress. I'm working with my editor, um, who's a lovely young man who helps me with sound design. And him and I are really, really open to feedback and we actually appreciate it. It's very helpful. So I wanna start, what is a podcast? Many of you are probably familiar, but I kind of wanna go over the kind of format, why it's important and why I wanted to take on this project. So this is the dictionary definition from Miriam Webster. Um, kind of dry and boring, but it's a digital audio or video file or recording. It's usually part of a theme series, um, and it can be downloaded from a website to a media player or computer. Many of you are probably familiar with podcasts from either Spotify or Apple Podcasts, potentially Google Podcasts. There's some other smaller ones as, where, as well, but I imagine if you're listening to podcasts, that's where you're listening. Um, so that being downloaded from a website is not necessarily accurate, but that's all right. You can also use it as a verb. You can, he podcasts, she podcasts, um, someone's a podcaster, but kind of more specifically or how I think of podcasts is they're a really great opportunity to present long form content in a world where people are increasingly engaged with short term content. 
Um, I'm 24, so I have a lot of um, friends who are super, super into TikTok. They're on Instagram Reels. And to succeed in that content format, you kind of need to be making videos that are a minute to two minutes long, which, as you can imagine, does not provide a lot of opportunity for nuance, for any sort of conversation. You just need to grab people's attention immediately, say whatever jumps out, and if they don't like it, they're going to scroll and go on to the next. So podcasting is really unique at the moment in that it's a long form media format that allows you to dive into various things, whatever it is. I'll talk about a few different types of podcasts, but I think it's really unique and I think it's really important and young people are engaged with it, which is another thing I'll talk about, but it's one of the few long form formats that people my age actually seem to be interested in. So there are a few different types of podcasts. Um, I thought I'll briefly go over them. Some of you might be familiar with the news podcasts. These are usually daily podcasts. They come out every single day. Um, the BBC World Service does one. I'm Canadian, so we have some Canadian newspapers that do them. I'm sure the American newspapers and news agencies do as well, or wherever it is you're listening from, you're probably, you might be familiar with that type. Um, there's also interview podcasts, which are kind of the original form of podcasting. It's two people, potentially more, just sitting together, having a conversation. It's usually very light editing and it's uploaded and you can kind of scroll through and select the ones you want to listen to. So if it's a long series, you look for names or look for interviews that seem interesting to you, you click on them and then you can listen. The other bucket of podcasts are these thematic or series-based podcasts. These are kind of your true crime podcasts. True crime is the most popular format of podcasting at the time. Those shows perform the best. And there's also, it's the most saturated format as well. There's a lot of true crime podcasts. Um, and they're meant to list, be listened to sequentially. So you maybe it's a five episode series about if we're going with the true crime theme about a certain crime or a certain event, and you're meant to listen to them in order from episode one to five. There's some sort of storyline, there's characters. It's usually driven by a host. Um, sometimes that's a journalist, sometimes it's an unnamed narrator, but you're meant to listen to them in order. And I personally have always enjoyed listening to narrative podcasts. And I also think they're the most interesting to make. Um, they're more complicated to make, but you actually get to kind of continue the conversation over various episodes. And that's what my plan is for this project. Um, at the moment, it's planned as a five episode series, but that's also in flux right now as I do interviews and research and, and talk to everyone here and talk to my editor and him and I kind of come together and, and figure that out. So that being said, I've just thrown up some of these are just some of the most popular podcasts kind of at the moment. Um, Smart List is, is very well known. It's an interview based podcast, but it's with um, some celebrities. So people really kind of get enjoy that. This is the Global News podcast by BBC World Service. Um, here on the right is a podcast called Caller Daddy, which is extremely popular with people my age. This is a BBC Sounds true crime called The Missing Crypto Queen. And this is a CBC podcast that is a true crime one. Um, all of them are very good if you like podcasts, but kind of just to give you a taste of, of what different genres of podcasting look like. So why a podcast? And I also want to kind of jump into why I took on this, this project with the caveat that I am not an Orwell expert. I think that's important for me to say. Um, there's a lot of experts on this call and, and I'm not one of them. My inspiration for for actually doing this is when I found out I won the award and I, I got on the train down to London and I came to the to the AGM. If you were there, it was the one in April of 2022. The meeting opened with a quiz, a quiz about Orwell. And, you know, I've always considered myself someone who has read, I read a lot of his works. I've been interested in him, um, inspired some of the journalism that I was doing. But I found this quiz extremely difficult. I could answer maybe one or two questions. And it really made me pause and reflect and think I've been given this wonderful award named in honor of someone that I actually don't know that much about. I'm familiar with his writings, but I don't really know much beyond that. And I got home from that meeting and I mentioned that to some people in my life, my parents, my friends, and found that they were largely in the same boat. There was a lot of people who they read 1984, they read Animal Farm they're familiar, but the larger picture and the larger context is missing. They don't have a lot of insight into what his life was like, what his inspirations were like, maybe even the historical context. And I myself was in that boat. 
so this project started as me just doing research for myself, trying to understand, trying to do more reading and just kind of get deeper insight. And as I was telling people in my life about this, and I was moving into the podcasting space, I realized that it would make it's a perfect opportunity for a podcast. There's, I think, so many people in the same position that I was, especially my age, where maybe they read some of those works in high school, they're mildly familiar, and then it kind of goes to the back of their mind. But meanwhile, as I'm sure y'all, you're all aware, um, Orwell's name is used consistently throughout media all the time, especially on social media. I hear people my age mentioning 1984, especially all the time. And I just thought this larger context is missing. And this is a great opportunity for to create a podcast. Um, and, and so that's what I that's what I've been doing slowly but surely. And I approached the Orwell Society and thankfully they were really keen to help, which has been lovely and, and their support has been so important to this project um, in terms of putting me in contact with people and, and allowing me to speak to you all today about what I'm doing and why I think it's important. So I, I really appreciate that as well. So I just realized I've left the D out of podcast on this slide. I apologize about that. Um, that is a mistake. I apologize. So why a podcast as well? We have so 40% of Gen Z, which are people born post 1995. So I fall into that bucket, listen to podcasts weekly, and they consume an average of 10.6 hours of podcasts a week, which is pretty incredible considering how much time that is out of your week. And we also have 43% of 35 to 54 year olds listen to podcasts weekly. Again, a pretty incredible st statistic. And why a lot of podcasters and people who do research in the industry think this happens is their long form content that can be listened to during a secondary activity. If you hop in your car, you can throw in a podcast, you're cleaning your house, you can throw in a podcast, you're walking your dog, you can throw in the podcast, right? And some new research has come out and it's not public yet, so I can't say who's done it. Um, but kind of one of the big players in the podcast industry, they had people wash dishes while they were listening to podcasts to see how much information they could actually retain. And it was quite a high number. People, even though they were doing another activity, they're still super engaged in what they're listening to, which I think is another really kind of interesting part of podcasts in that even if you're listening to them kind of in the background or you're doing some sort of other activity, people remain really, really engaged. My favorite thing to do when I'm listening to podcasts, I love them for planes and I love them for walking my dog in the morning. I think they're perfect for that. So what were my goals going into this project? The first one is I wanted it to be narrative driven. That was important to me just because that's what I personally lean towards and also where the industry is headed. Um, just from a industry perspective, the narrative podcasts are performing a lot better right now on the charts. Um, interview podcasts are are starting to falter a little bit. They're, the expectations are getting higher as bigger players come into that space. Like BBC is in the interview space now, CBC, even some um, big kind of movie studios are moving into the podcasting space. So standing out is becoming a lot harder. And I decided to place myself as the host of this podcast because I think that my position is relatively relatable and that I am, I was familiar with Orwell, I was familiar with his works, but beyond that, I actually didn't know as much as I thought I did. Um, I wasn't super aware of his background. So kind of just placing myself as a relatable host that the listener can, can kind of understand and relate to, and I get to talk to experts who are gonna educate the listener and myself as we go on this journey together. That's how I see this happening. I'd love for people to listen to it in order, kind of as more of a narrative, but they don't have to, if they want to pick and choose, you'll see the way I've set out the, the episodes are kind of in this chronological order. So if people do want to pick and choose, they can, and people do that a lot. It's not so narrative driven that you're going to be lost if you don't listen to the first few, but I do kind of want to keep it in the narrative stream, nonfiction though, of course. I also want to, like I said, reset audience who's somewhat familiar with Orwell, 1984, Animal Farm, but they're unaware of the larger legacy and the influences on his work, as I've said. And also just that podcasts are extremely popular among young people and reaching this demographic is a key goal of mine. And I think a key goal for the society as well. Um, and I want to ladder into that and take advantage of that opportunity there. Okay, I'm gonna take a sip of water. All right, I will go to my next slide. So this is kind of my target audience when I'm thinking of the podcast. Typically when I create a podcast, this target audience is about three pages long. 
Um, I think target audiencing, uh, properly targeting an audience is one of the most important things you can do in content creation. Um, and also in podcasting as well. I hear from a lot of clients, at least, that they want to make a podcast for everyone or they want to make a podcast for the masses. And ultimately, if that's your goal, you're almost making a podcast for no one, right? If I came into this project saying that I wanted to make an Orwell podcast, the podcast that I'd make for people on this call today would be vastly different than the podcast I'd make for maybe a grade 11 classroom who's reading 1984 and the teacher's looking for something to accompany those kids as, as they read it. Those are two vastly different audiences and those are going to be really different podcasts about the same thing but really different target audiences that inform what the format's going to be, who the guests are going to be, the general flow of the podcast. Sorry, I'm having a lot of light come in here right now, which is nice because I live in Canada, but not uh, not ideal at the moment. So my target audience, in my mind at least, is kind of inspired by who I am and my friends are, the people around me who I'd love to listen to this. They're 18 to 35 years old. They're a, a regular podcast listener. They're interested in literature and are mildly familiar with Orwell. Um, maybe they've read some works, but I think because I'm not an expert, but I'm speaking to experts, having that really niche expert target audience is, I wouldn't do a good job. I think that if you listen to that yourselves, you you might, I wouldn't, I'm not a voice of authority and I, and I don't want to be either. My secondary audience, super um, similar, same age group more of a pod casual podcast listener. This is your podcast listener who's just kind of scrolls through the podcasting apps. They pick type, they pick podcasts based on titles and cover art. That's kind of why I've gone for the name behind Big Brother. That's an instant kind of light bulb that goes off in people's heads. They're familiar with that. Even if they click on the podcast, it's not necessarily about what they thought it was going to be about. It's to kind of get that recognition and have them just click on it to see if it piques their interest. That's important to me in terms of just getting people to make that initial click. That's very difficult in podcasting at least. And they might be familiar with Orwell by name only. That might be kind of the extent of their knowledge. So these people might listen to one or two episodes. The of course wish is that they're going to listen to all five, but I always think about my secondary audience as someone who they're going to listen to a few episodes. I want some of them to convert over to my primary audience and become champions of the show. So people that are going to go tell their friends, maybe they're going to post about it on social media, um, but not all of them are going to do that and that's okay. So the, now I'm going to kind of briefly go into my to my format. Um, this is where this is the area where it's the most in flux, at least just in terms of I have an idea of what I want to talk about in each episode. But as I'm conducting interviews and more and more things are coming up, I think that the the lens is expanding on what I could speak about and what these episodes could look like. So I'm really interested to hear what at least you all have to say your thoughts on on the format. So each episode will run for approximately 40 to 60 minutes. Um, I'm leaning more towards 40 to 45 minutes at the moment only because I'm working on another show with work that's somewhat similar to this. And we tend to lose a lot of people around the 40 minute mark. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that people don't typically engage in like walking their dog or doing the dishes or cleaning their house for maybe an hour at a time. That's kind of a, a longer block of time. Most people tend to do that for closer to 40 minutes. That's kind of our hypothesis of why that's happening, but that's informing the length of the episodes as well. I think that the hour is actually seeming too long um, just in terms of how other podcasts are performing, which I obviously want to inform what I'm doing from um, my experience at work. And it's going to include interviews. That's a really big basis of this. Um, and instead of each in each episode, being like one interview, what I like to do and what I find effective is I just cut pieces from interviews and I layer them in with narration in between to kind of build a larger story. So you might hear from three or four people in one episode. You might hear from the same people across all five episodes. Um, it's not just like one episode is an interview with someone because I think that's that's wonderful and that's great, but I really am trying to kind of set it up in this chronological structure and because of that, many people have spoken I've spoken to can speak to large swaths of of the chronology. And so I want to make sure that their voice is um, wherever their expertise are, and that also that we get to hear a variety of voices. Um, as I said, as the discussions begin and further research is done, the structure may change and additional episodes may be added. That's still kind of where I am, at least at the moment. 
So episode one, um, as I said, I'm kind of going for this chronological structure. I put in um, italics here, the works that I'm planning on speaking about. I'm actually not completely confirmed on, on which works belong where. Um, so if that's something you have thoughts on, please, please let me know. Um, I'm also kind of trying to figure out the best way to actually present the works. I'm considering having someone read excerpts out um, from some of them. That's that's not me just kind of bringing a different voice. A lot of podcasts will use voice actors and whatnot, but I'm not I'm not totally sure on that right now. I'm also curious to hear, to hear if you have any thoughts on that or if you've listened to podcasts that do that. I have and I like it, but I know I know not everyone does. So this episode, as I'm sure you can see, we're going to talk about his childhood, including such such were the joys, talk about Eaton. Um, for my North American listeners, I think that there needs to be a little context about what Eaton is. I don't think a lot of people know. I myself, when I got to the UK, was really confused about what a public school was because public school in Canada is the equivalent of state school. So just some additional context there. What his life was like and his role was in Burma. Um, talk about at this point I had used Orwell throughout all of it but at this point it's Eric Blair of course um talk about Burmese days and how his outlook on life and writings would come to be influenced by this period by imperialism um and how these experiences his childhood um the, the economic situation he grew up what he was exposed to at school would come to influence him later on episode two I'm calling London and Paris this is an episode that I'm less sure on um I think it's I really want it to be in there but I'm not quite sure where in the chron chronology it necessarily fits um or where I want that that episode so in this episode we talk about living among the tramps why he was doing that and what that looked like what did people think about it um we're going to talk about down and out in London and Paris and the road to Wigan Pier and in many of the interviews I've done this has been one of my favorite areas to talk about because I think it's the one that I have have the least exposure to or that I've actually found less on generally I found on kind of discussion forums because I wanted to see what what people outside the society were saying see what people's kind of in the ethers questions were see if I could answer them this seems to be a period that really comes into focus like that so I I want to make sure that this episode is answering those questions the third this is one that I'm considering breaking into two episodes um because of how much information there is. So just kind of the historical context. Unfortunately, a lot of people my age, I don't think they know very much about um, the Spanish Civil War. I think that context is missing for a lot of them. I did not know anything about it until I was in university and I was taking history as my undergraduate degree. It's not something I learned about in school um, at all. So I don't know if it's different in, in different countries, but at least in the Canadian, I imagine probably the American education system as well. It's that that context is completely missing. So I wanna make sure that there's just a little bit of that. Um, we're going to talk about the May Day, and Poom, of course, the initial formation of his opposition to communism and how it marked the beginning of the articulation of his opposition to all to totalitarian regimes and the espousal of democratic socialism, as well as homage to Catalonia. This is a lot for one episode, I think, um, as I'm doing this and I, even as I'm speaking, as I've been practicing this presentation and, and giving it to um, a few people in my family, I've the more I say it, the more I think this potentially belongs as two episodes, um, just because it's such a rich period. And we also, um, it's such an interesting period generally for, for literature. So I think it might be interesting to break it into two. Episode four is Eileen. Um, I really, really wanted to have an episode on, on Eileen at that AGM that I was at. There was um, a talk about Eileen. I unfortunately can't remember who gave it, but I remember it really, really well. And just, it was really eye-opening for me. I'd I honestly had never heard of Eileen um, at the time. I wasn't aware of her. So I really wanted to, to do this. And I've spoken to Sylvia um, about her wonderful book, um, which is going to be um, a big inspiration for this episode. Um, and I know there's a lot of conversation going on about this right now. So potentially addressing some of that as well. Um, I have not read Wifedom yet. I'm not going to be like using it at all. Um, but I know that, that there's a conversation going on around that right now. So um, that also makes me think this episode is really important just to hopefully people who read the book might li also listen to the podcast and, and try and find, you know, other points of view as well. Episode five, I'm kind of calling the World War II Animal Farm in 1984 episode. Again, this is one that's probably going to get broken up. 
um, maybe some about his time at the BBC. I'm not sure how much, how important that will, how much time that'll necessarily take up. The Cold War context, I am someone who's really, really interested in the history of the Cold War. Um, I'd love to have the opportunity to talk about it. I also think, unfortunately, it's context that's missing for a lot of people my age. We do learn about the Cold War in school, but I think a lot of people it just kind of leaves their mind, to be honest, and they don't think about the context of what was going on when they're when they're thinking about the works today. Talk about Jura, of course, and Animal Farm in 1984 as well. So this is just a list of who I've spoken to so far. If you have, if you see this list and think, oh my gosh, there's a million people missing, which I'm sure there is, please let me know. I'm happy if you're on this call and you want to be interviewed or if you have an area of expertise that I've spoken to, please let me know. I'm really happy to make those connections. I'll I'll drop my email um, in the chat so you can reach out to me if you'd like to. Um, that would be wonderful. So just to kind of show everyone that. And then this is a little bit more kind of my wheelhouse, but distribution and marketing. I did want to talk a little bit about what it's like to actually launch a podcast. And if you'd like to support me when it comes out and how that, how that kind of looks. So I always, any launch I do, I give a press release to Pod News. It's the biggest newsletter in the podcasting industry. It's largely going out to people within the industry, um, but people are really warm and welcoming in the podcasting industry. They love to support each other. Um, and they love to share if you're a, a full-time producer and you're working on a kind of project on, on the side, people are really, really kind in terms of sharing. So that's important. Submit to podcast newsletters. There's a lot of really niche podcast newsletters that will once a week give out the recommendations for podcasts in about literature, podcasts about historical figures, um, whatever it may be. So submitting to those is really important. Um, that's something that I'm going to take care of, of course, but if for whatever reason you're subscribed to a podcast newsletter or you're subscribed to a newsletter generally that you think um, might be interested in talking about the podcast, that would be wonderful as well. Um, I'm going to share audiograms, which are audio clips on social media. This is me kind of leaning into that two minute to catch your attention um, bit there as well. You can kind of create these audio wave videos, which I'm pretty familiar with doing, and you kind of take a a clip from the episode that you think is really poignant will grab someone's attention and hopefully get them to go listen to the rest of the episode is the ultimate goal. And then of course, share with all of you. Um, podcasts are a very interesting medium in that they they have yet to be completely kind of taken over by, by large companies that if you want advertising or you want attention, you have to go to a PR agency or you have to hire someone, you have to... Um, have a studio produce your show. Um, the industry is still in a, in a spot where you don't need to do that. So having what we like to call podcast champions, so just people who like the podcast and want to share it with their friends and family, goes a huge way in terms of marketing and distribution and just getting word out for it. That's still really, really important in the industry right now. So um, just finding people who, who want to talk about it and want to share, um, that's really, really important to me as well. Um, in terms of the timeline, the chronology of what's going on right now, if you're curious about that, I'm really hoping to have it out out in the new year. Um, unfortunately, I've, there's been quite a few circumstances that I would love to have not have happened um, with work and then some other things as well. That's I was hoping to have it out in November. Um, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, I want it to. I want to be really intentional with it and do a good job. So I'd rather take that time, really sit down with my editor and make sure that it's sounding great. Um, he's a really talented sound designer. I've worked with him before and he just really helps bring things to life and, and help tell the stories that I want to tell and, and keep listeners engaged as well. If you've ever listened to a podcast, we always like to say bad audio quality is the number one thing that loses people right off the bat. So that's, that's really important to me as well. That's largely kind of what I want to talk about. I'm really hoping you, if you have questions about the podcast industry, or podcasting generally, I'm really comfortable with answering those and I'd love to do that. If you have feedback on this format or anything like that, I'm all ears and I'm, I'm yeah, it's, I'm excited to kind of jump into a QA and a and, and talk a little bit more about the project. I think I'll stop sharing my screen though. It's probably the best thing to do. Awesome. Thank you very much indeed. That was uh, uh, very informative for an old codger like me, so I, I hope it was for everybody else. I'm sure it was. Um, 
who uh, I, I see people are asking for your um, email address. If you'd just like to yeah, type I'll, that in, I'll, I'll, I'll type it in. Yeah, and uh, Douglas, uh, please, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Quentin. It's not really a question. I just want to say this is fantastic. I think it's really interesting. And Quincy, I feel that you'd be a very, very good host for this kind of thing as a, with your very good manner. I would love to be involved in this. I've got a bit of experience with podcasting. Um, I quite like the look of the anatomy that you have in mind, except I feel that when you start to dig down a bit more you're going to find episode five is far too crowded. You've got mm. BBC, Animal Farm, 1984. That's a hell of a lot for half an yeah. hour or 40 minutes. So maybe um, mm. it will be necessary to do a bit of juggling. And I would think, and speaking personally, I think giving a whole episode to Spain might be something you could reconsider. Mm -hmm. um, but okay. that obviously would depend on how it goes. Anyway, I, I will write to you, Quincy, um, <clears throat> and it'd be, I think this is fantastic. Well done. Thank you. Yeah, and, and thank you for the, the feedback on, on the format. That's, that's really helpful as well. Peter, good evening. Good, good morning, Thank rather than your case. Okay. Thanks very much for that very interesting talk. Uh, I have two questions. What the, what's the financial situation? How is this all paid for? But also, uh, I don't understand. I personally would find it much more satisfactory uh, if if they were combined video, uh, and I, I, that rarely happens. It's my impression that technically it's not that much of a challenge, but I might be wrong about that. And presumably people who want to do it while they're using walking the dog or secondary activities, uh, they don't have to watch the videos. But I personally would find these much more... Uh, I, I would like to have a video, and I don't understand why that, as far as I can tell, it, it doesn't ever happen or very rarely happens. I think it's so in terms of the video format, why it's harder with the, with the narrative formats is if you're editing audio and you're cutting interviews, it's hard. It makes the video look like you're kind of jumping from, from spot to spot. We've also found, at least when I've done video podcasts, unless they're really highly produced and people want graphics now, like they've kind of gotten used to having a lot with their YouTube videos or whatnot, whatnot, they're just not unfortunately like satisfied with the talking heads, so to speak. I'm looking into video with my editor and and seeing what we can do about that. Um, in terms of from my perspective, I'm just not an expert at video at all. Um, what I'm and I have all my equipment for audio. So in terms of the financials, I'm kind of self funding with with my editor, and then I also have you can see like my my microphone and I have all my own editing equipment um, through work. So that's not a problem for me there, but it's with the video that I would, that's harder for me to pull off just kind of as an individual and also with my, um, with my editor as well. And, and kind of just figuring out how to make it in a format that is similar enough to the audio that you're not having a completely different video podcast and audio podcast if that it's definitely something I'm keeping in mind and I'm I'm seeing if it's something I could pull off because I agree it's I like having the videos. I think people like the videos. Um, but I just want to make sure I I do it right and I do it kind of informed by what's going on, what I see at least going on within the industry is and unfortunately the videos are having to become higher and higher quality, so to speak. Thank you. Uh Hans. Hi there, hi there, Quincy. Thank you very much for your talk. This is my first visit to a Norwell talk, and it's a great one to, to come in on. So thank you for that clear presentation. Um, I think my question is really about um, going back to where you started, about trying to engage a younger audience. And for mm -hmm. a lot of the 18 to 35-year-old audience, perhaps 1984, Animal Farm, these works are works that are kind of in their zeitgeist. And I wondered mm -hmm. about whether you might, in order to build, to catch and build your audience, whether you might start 
at that point and then work back, dig dig deeper, as it were, from those works that are, are clearly kind of well known and, and perhaps more accessible for younger people. Yeah, I think that's a really interest an interesting way of doing it. And and um I how I'm writing the scripts is I'm kind of opening with discussing kind of an animal farm in 1984 and trying to hook people in with that and then kind of going into this but you don't know the real story kind of kind of idea but I do think that's really an interesting way of doing it and that's definitely um you've definitely kind of put something in my mind there that I might explore a little bit more because I do think that that's interesting and to your point that's what people's from that is what people my age are familiar with hence the title that's what's gonna you know grab their attention and probably those are the works they've been exposed to through in school at least which is how I think a lot of people my age um why they're familiar or they're just familiar with Orwell or Big Brother from from the news and from kind of the the zeitgeist right now thank you Hans that's uh very helpful uh Felicia mm -hmm. Nemo thank you am I unmuted you are Thank you. As an old person who thinks people in her age group are just as valuable as young people, I'd like to know what you're going to do to engage old people who are not very familiar with podcasts. Yeah, so what I think I want to do, and, and to your point, older people and older demographics definitely are important. Don't get me wrong. Um, me, I say old people, not older. I would never use older. Plain <laughs> old, old is just fine with me. We don't need euphemisms. I apologize for interrupting you, though. No, no, not to worry. So I think when I distribute it, especially among people here. I can I'm gonna put instructions just on how to how to find it and, and how to share it if, if you'd like to. Um I'm also looking at just putting it on a website. A lot of podcasts you can just play um directly off of a website. I, I won't go into how that works because it's podcasts have this their whole kind of technical side to them, but you can place them on a website. And if we if the Orwell Society wants them on the website, that's something that I can give them the the tools to do if that's helpful the answer to that is yes please so we can put it on the website then that's that's easy enough to do um and just make sure people understand how and where they can access them i think is really important and i'm hoping that the content while it's maybe geared to someone who's younger that it'll be universally at least enjoyable and understandable it's not like i'm going to be kind of calling out directly that this is for this age group um, it's just kind of the tool that I'm using to to try and access them. Thank you. Uh, Brian. Oh, hi, Quincy. Thanks very much for that really interesting uh, talk. Um, just, just sort of, I'm just interested in, in what the aim of the Orwell Society is in this. Obviously, we're, we're seeking to increase membership and always to expand people's understanding of Orwell, but I just wondered if you had some thoughts about, in a sense, the demographic, you know, the people that you've, you're you listening to tonight and others um, are a much older demographic, I think. Um, do you think, you know, the idea that we're going to increase membership by doing this is is sort of really not, not likely because younger people are not looking to join traditional organisations in the way in which many of us you know, are used to joining organisations. Well, I just we, wonder what, what might come from that, yeah. Well, I mean, factually, Brian, we do have uh, probably 10 to 15% of our, our membership is well within this demographic. Um, and those that do get in, involved uh, really get involved in the same way as anybody else. Um our interest as trustees in seeking to encourage any uh, thing which would attract younger members, and that's why I was keen to encourage Quincy, um, is that <laughs> we want the society to, to continue and uh, we don't want it to have a fuse on it related to our own lifespans. Yeah. My, 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 my thoughts were just about the way in which and I don't know, Quincy can't talk for younger people any more than I can talk for older people, but um just strikes me that, you know, perhaps that type of organisational structure and membership just, just isn't necessarily the way forward for 
developing the Orwell society in the format that we're familiar with, perhaps. I will say from my perspective, I think a lot of people my age just aren't aware that things like this exist. I certainly wasn't. And when I tell people, I don't think it's something people, to your point, are actively seeking out. Um, my hope is that even if a few people listen to this and and I'm going to call out the society and all of them, even if it piques their interest enough to go on the website and hopefully one or two people, it'll just further engage them or or just make them aware that this exists and is something that if they like the podcast and they want more information and they're interested in learning more, that this is a place they can turn to. And um, my hope is that at least for for someone or a few people out there, that that'll be enough for them to to engage them but to your point probably a lot of people will just listen and move on and i i think that's all right as well if if they're leaving with with more learnings and and feeling like they've enjoyed the podcast that's important to me as well but i'm hoping that for at least a few people it piques their interest enough that they're they're going to consider joining thanks for that uh gavin good evening you're on mute, please. Thanks. Yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, Quentin. That was a very interesting talk, Quincy. My my uh, questions are sort of related. One is, is this a one-off project of podcast of five or six? Um, or would it be possible for there to be a follow-up series of podcasts looking at other aspects of Oral's work and life? Because in the list of, of uh, your contents, the one important part of his work that I, I felt was was uh, notably omitted, and I understand the constraints of space, where his work as an essayist, whether it be his short um, As I Pleased pieces for Tribune, or his longer, uh, thoughtful, insightful ones such as Inside the Whale and so on. And that is an important, in my view, that's an important part of Orwell's legacy. And uh, I would agree. I'm glad, you, glad you've raised that, Gavin. Yeah, I mean, uh, his best writing is probably in in those fields rather than the ones he's best known for. So yeah, I I, I completely agree with you. Um, to start that I, and some of the essays aren't aren't mentioned here, but I am I am hoping to to mention them more. Mm. Kind of my episode plan was also informed by just kind of talking to people in my life, and they were kind of let me know that if they were interested in that they might seek it out somewhere else like that I might not be the necessarily the person to tell them about that but I think that's a good call out to try and include that more because I totally agree with you and I've been reading a lot more of his essays over the last year or so and and completely agree that they're really important and that I should make a concerted effort to definitely include them more um, and to your first question right now I have it kind of as the five episode series, but I think there's definitely opportunity to to expand it. What I usually kind of like to do is do a, a post-mortem of the season um, about a month after everything is launched to see how many people are listening. Um, I can see how long they've listened for, if there's points they drop off. If there's like a massive drop off in one of the episodes, I can see what people are interested in and whatnot. And there's some fantastic new podcasting tools that have come out that allow people to engage with the episodes. On Spotify, for example, you can make a poll and ask people what was your favorite part of this episode? Was something missing? And they can type it directly in and let you know. So I think gathering feedback after the five episodes, just to see, is there interest for more episodes? What should they be about? Um, I'm definitely I'm definitely open to that. That's something that I think is one of the great things about podcasts is that there's often always an opportunity to tell more of a story and it's a great format, format to do it. But I have written down your note about the essays and I, I do agree with you that that's missing from this largely right now. So just making finding an effective way to to include them to the proper degree that I I don't want to lose people either, so to speak. So just finding the right amount um, to to put in there is something that I'll that I'll think about. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, Gavin. Uh, evening, Sylvia. hear me? Yep, you can now. Hi, Quincy. Hi, how are you? Okay, I'm in Kingston, you know, not so far from you. So maybe we'll get together for real sometime. <clears throat> I just wanted to second for sure the idea of the essays. That's what I've been thinking about all along. 
uh, young people, I think it's unfortunate that all they've read or even heard of is 1984 and Animal Farm, which they do in school, you know, when they're very young and maybe not even ready for those. And it wouldn't have to be the whole essays, you know, it could be excerpts from essays or excerpts from his other novels, which are quite interesting too. And um, when I talk to people, I'm I'm shocked to find some have never been heard of Orwell, young people, let alone you know, Big Brother and everything else. But there's some really good essays that I think would appeal to young people. I don't know how closely you've looked into that yet. There should even be a collection, a written collection of his essays, I think, if someone had the energy and time to do that, essays for younger people by Orwell. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. No, it's um, I appreciate you bringing that up, and and I do I do think it's important. So it's something that I'm going to one of the many things I'll take away from this, and just um, think about how I'm how I'm going to integrate that, and and where the best places to slot them in are as well yeah i mean the the, the fact of the matter is there is an enormous amount of material he mm -hmm. was incredibly productive for a short period of time relatively um so don't feel you've got to try and get everything into the first one if we, we can attract people to your podcast regularly then the follow up, you you know, you've got plenty of things to follow up with. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Les. Thank you. Uh, hello, Quincy. Um, yes, just following up that point, um, I'd suggest that well, when we're talking about the essays, what we're actually talking about is is um, themes. So that one talk is, for instance, Orwell and language which would come out of his essays on 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 language uh, Orwell and crime which would come out of his his writings about uh, real life crime um or and particularly um Orwell and mass culture now culture in a sense is very different today mass culture is very different in many ways but possibly the underlying themes are the same, which Orwell was pointing out, where he was talking about the movies and the effect of the radio. Um, and of course, the the essay, which is very appropriate for what you're doing, is, is his essay called uh, Poetry in the Microphone, mm -hmm. um, which will probably have some clues for you for um, um, in, in that area. Um, and I'm sure that there are another two or three subject areas which can be extracted from the uh, the essays in a similar way. Um, you were saying that you had a degree in medieval history. Um, and of course, um, we know that Orwell from um, from his um, from the 1920s onwards was reading uh, books about Shakespeare's England, which during the war led him to observe that the climate had changed between Shakespeare's time and his own. Um, it's only a one short article, but it shows that he'd been aware of something um, or or his observations on um, on the Robin Hood ballads of the late medieval period. <laughs> There's an awful lot in there which uh, you can find has um, a personal relevance um, if one looks around simply because his reading and his references are so wide ranging. But I'd suggest when we're talking about the essays, what we're really talking about is themes. Well, and in, in in that regard, also, um, I don't know if you've you've seen this book. Hmm. Uh, Paul Anderson's collected together all his writing for Tribune, which includes uh, all, all all the as I please. Yeah, as I please is the closest thing to a blog before anybody would ever heard of a blog. Uh, he, he would say something in one one edition. And people would respond, and he'd respond, and and on it went. It was a, it became a sort of conversation, which is, I'm sure, of of, of interest to uh, to anybody if if the, to look at it in that way. Mm -hmm. Or yeah, as the proto blogger, another theme. Yeah, okay. that's been what I mean. Honestly, one of my struggles in this is that there's so much I could talk about, and there's so much material. It's 
Mm. You know, how how do you approach well, that? No, you, it's, you, there's you, a lot. You look at it from the point of view of marketing what you're you're selling. You you, you understand your audience. You pick the order and, and the content you start with. And you as I say, you know there's plenty more to follow on with. Mm-hmm. Um Felicity an email again. Thank you. Um this is my own particular hobby horse, as people who heard my talk last month know, but I think it's really important when telling people about 1984 to stress that there's much more to it than simply politics, the surveillance state, totalitarianism, and so forth. And I really hope that when you discuss it, you'll make people aware of Orwell's enormous insights about love, betrayal, self-control, the limits of love, how you reconstruct your life after you betrayed someone, or maybe how you can't, or well views about physical appearance, all sorts of things that go way beyond the political and have relevance to virtually everybody. I also want to second Sylvia's point about um, considering the other novels. Many people are unaware that Orwell wrote any fiction other than Animal Farm and 1984, and some of the other novels mesh very well with the essays. For example, uh, Burmese Days meshes very well with things like shooting an elephant and a hanging, and um, A Clergyman's Daughter meshes very well with some of the material in, um, down and out in Paris and London. And I think it's important to keep in mind that people should be aware of his other novels too. Yeah, I'm hoping to um have in the in the show notes the description where people can click, direct them towards um, kind of the other works and stuff. I I will say that. I while I I do really want to get into the themes and whatnot in in all the in his works and his books and I, and I think that's a really important point. I also want to I don't want it to turn into a like a literature critique podcast either, just because that's I don't think I'm the right person to talk about that. Um, I don't think I have the expertise in that area, and I want there's so much to mention, and I want to make sure that I have that that those voices are there, but I also want to make sure I'm staying in this kind of narrative form that I've kind of decided on and where I feel my particular skills lend themselves best to just in terms of the podcast that I have produced in the past and and how I think I can kind of get people to listen to it so to speak so I do like I really it's important to me to to find to strike that balance and inevitably I think there's going to be a lot left out unfortunately like I think that's the these are 45 minute episodes they're going to be I think maximum eight episodes there's unfortunately going to be things that that don't make it in so it's I'm going to make a concerted effort for people do want to learn more have all the links and everything that they need there to to go and and find out more if if something does pique their interest because it's it's um yeah just just finding that balance between sticking with the format and and making sure people are, are engaged throughout the episodes um if they're not listening to it if they're more kind of more listening to it because they want this in insight into into his life as well so that's something I, that's something i will say about that and i i know that there's stuff that's going to be left out of every episode inevitably unfortunately uh, everybody's got their own little perspective you can't satisfy everybody's you have to be convincing on what you're presenting that's the important thing mm-hmm. sylvia Hello again. Yeah, I I don't want you to forget Orwell's humor. He's taken as such a serious writer all the time. Mm-hmm. There's so many examples of his humor in his writing that you could collect somehow. Or uh, why don't you ask all of us to send in examples of you know excerpts from his writing that we all love that you could, so you don't have to be reading every single thing he wrote, you know, to find them, because you have all the experts here listening now. And I could send some humorous parts of Aspidistra, keep the Aspidistra blind. And many of his books have great humor in it that I think that young people would really appreciate. As well as predictions, Les posted something that was right after um, the Second World War, it seemed almost it could be written today, predictions of what the world would be like. 
Yeah, I think that that's actually a, a wonderful idea, actually, if people want to email me, if you have a, if you have a favorite excerpt or want something you want included, then like, please email me. That would be fantastic. I'm, I'm doing as much reading as I can. Um, but inevitably there'll be something I miss. So if you have something that you think I, I have to read or you, it's your favorite or whatnot, please feel, feel free to, to send that my way. Um, I'm trying to think of the best way to logistically why I set that up. Cause I, maybe I can make a, a Google form or something like that, where people can, can submit that, or, um, you can just email me as well, but I don't want to, to miss anyone's email or anything like that. So I'll, I'll brainstorm on what the best way to do that is as well. And then make sure you all find out about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Douglas. Um, I'm beginning to feel really sorry for Quincy, um, because we're all coming up with really good ideas of what could be included um, in the podcast. But she's only got two and a half hours, three and a half hours. And in, in my limited experience, <coughs> one of the worst things you can do with a podcast is to overstuff it. To try and put too much stuff in, then it becomes sort of clogged and incoherent and you run out of time and, and it's awful. Also, as I think Quincy said, you've got to leave plenty of time for the narrative because that, I think, is the thing that's going to run all the way through it. It's a story. Mm. Um, and the story of Orwell's life is a fantastic story and it should bring a lot of people in. And you need to give space in each podcast to say, this is what he was doing. These are things that happened to him while he was thinking about this and writing these things. So um, I don't envy her <laughs> putting all these things together. We'll say, they said all, all of the ideas that people have suggested are really good, but we're going to end up with many, many hours. No. So no, she, I think she, 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 has, Quincy just she has, has to, to decide what the story is. You're absolutely yeah. right, Douglas. Exactly. The, the, a good example of what Douglas is describing as getting the narrative. Uh, have you seen the complete poetry, Quincy? Uh, no, actually. Uh, Di Dione put together a book with all his poems in, but what makes it distinguished, in my view, is how she set each poem in the context of when it was written. Um, Les, could we could could we send Quincy um a copy of the poetry? Thanks. I'll 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 give you her, her, her postal address separately. Yeah, and I, I will also say as as I mentioned, my background is I have my undergraduate degree in history and my, my master's in history. So just what's important to me as part of this is the historical context of the period as well. Um, you know, the Spanish Civil War, the Cold War, those mm. are, that's part of what I really want to be part of this as well. Cause I just speaking to people my age as someone who's really interested in history. I think so much of that is missing mm. just generally speaking. And that's just personally as, as my background, what I'm more comfortable in. And also just what I want to make sure is there because I think that that's really missing for a lot of people as well. I think that's important. I agree with you. Uh, Felicity Neiman. Brian. Sorry. Okay. I, I muted myself. Um, one thing that way I think you can get people of all ages interested without presenting a lot of stuff is to look at some of Orwell's wonderful quotations that can be considered in isolation. I found this very useful with my students. I'll just mention two or three of them to give you an idea of what I have in mind. The best books are those that tell you what you know already. Obviously, false of what you want to learn about is Chinese history, but true in terms of encapsulating an insight that you had but couldn't quite formulate or, for example, for reflections on Gandhi, to an ordinary human being, love means nothing if it does not mean loving some people more than others. Or from 1984, if you want to keep a secret, you must also hide it from yourself. I could go on, although I won't. In fact, I'm writing a paper about this. But it's a good way to get people interested in sparking up discussions without making them think, oh, God, I have to do a lot of reading. 
it might also get them interested in doing the reading where these things come from. Yeah, that's a really, I I think that's really interesting, especially if that's kind of resonating with students as well. Um, that, you know, that's, I think, something that I remember doing in, in school as well as we kind of just discuss various um, excerpts from whatever it was we were reading. So I think that's a really interesting way to approach it as well, especially since there is so much that could be said in every episode, maybe if it's a quotation here or there, just to pique people's interest and they can hopefully go and do their own reading, that that could be a, an interesting way to to engage people as well. I'll send you a list of my favorite maxims since you gave us a email your address. Yeah, please do. Please do. Anyone can email me. Thank you. Uh, Brian again. Oh, hi. Yeah, just, just to reiterate, I suppose, what other people have been saying so far, which is that you've got to think about the target audience here, and it's not, I guess, for the Orwell Society. Um, you're making it for people that are less familiar with Orwell, and therefore, you know, lots of the advice and lots of you must include this and you must remember to include that. Probably, you know, your 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 ideas are probably sound anyway, aren't they? You know, you've got an instinct for what younger people might be interested in and as I say you're not creating it for us as far as I'm aware. Yeah, it is I I think if I was to create a podcast for the people here, like I said, it'd be extremely different than the one I am creating. So I'm very aware of the fact that I'm sure there's there's gonna be episodes that if you're on the call right now, you think there's lots of things missing and they probably are missing. Um but Ultimately, my goal is for this to, I want people to listen to it. I want them to share it. I want it to be people kind of in myself, my, kind of like myself, so to speak. Um, like I'd want my, I want my friends to listen to all all the episodes and, and um, so striking that balance between how much to include to, to reach that target audience is um, something I've been thinking about a lot uh, on the slide of the target audience. Like I said, usually when I do target audiencing and how I have for this it's usually three or four pages long kind of how I've broken it out and I just talk to people and find out what they've read what they know what they're interested in does this pique your interest yes or no so that's been part of this process as well, well that's that's excellent uh Les again before we leave the evening can I can I uh, kidnap the event for uh 30 seconds and remind members that at Scardin Books on the 30th of November, we are presenting an episode of Orwell's Voice program uh, in person in the shop um, before uh, an audience. So that if you're within traveling distance of Scardin Books in Cromford in Derbyshire, um, you can telephone and book a place on the 30th of November, where we're recreating Orwell's Octo 42 episode of Voice the poetry of childhood. Who knows, perhaps it will allow me to uh, give you some more information on how to present Orwell to an audience. Uh, <laughs> let's see. Uh, there we go. That's at scarlinbooks.com Scarling for the details of how to uh, contact them and book a place. Thank you. I book for me and Liz. Thank you. <laughs> well, that's really stirred some interest, Quincy. Um, Please, uh, uh, you know, take Brian's point uh, and, and Douglas's point. Absolutely, it, 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 it suck in all this, but you decide what you want to present and how you want to present it. Um, and I, I, judging by what we've uh, heard from you tonight, I've every confidence that it'll be a super, super podcast. Well, thank you everyone for taking the time out to to listen to me and, and all your wonderful insights. I, I appreciate it. And I, I hope that um when the podcast does come out that that you'll listen and, and pass it around and I'll make sure that the society knows when when that's coming out. Um so that and it's uh something that you that you all enjoy and, and I, I appreciate having the opportunity to talk about it as well. I can I'll talk anyone's ear off about podcasting. So if you have any podcasting questions as well, uh that's something I do consider myself an expert in and I love to talk about. So um that if that piques your interest, then uh then I'll definitely talk some more about that. Uh thank you. Before we go, uh and before we thank Quincy, um ne next month's talk, uh can you see that? 
is um, the All World Tour uh, by Oliver Lewis, whose book follows uh, All World uh, through his life uh, by following the geography and talking about what he experienced uh, along that trail. So he's been everywhere from birthplace in Motahari uh, back to UCH, where he died and has different chapters on on each bit of that of life. Uh, it's it's a, a, a very interesting read, not as um, not not a heavyweight academic document. So it's a very readable book, and I'd encourage anybody to to buy it. Uh, please, could you unmute and thank Quincy for an excellent evening's talk. Thank you. Thank Thanks you, so much. Quincy. Amazing talk. Great. Thank yep. you, Quincy. Have a brilliant. Thank you all. Thank you.